Mr. Finchley Goes to Paris, adapted for radio by Andy and Eric Merriman, from the book of the same name by Victor Canny. Episode 3, in which Mr. Finchley hears a confession, counsels his client, and is taken for a ride. Mr. Edgar Finchley, a solicitor's clerk, is in Paris on business. He's just moved into new lodgings and has struck up a friendship with two of his fellow guests, young entomologist Lawrence Hume and an English governess, Marie Peters, and he's invited them to join him for a drink at a local cafe. I'm glad that you two are with me. I knew nothing at all about French drinks until you helped me out. I've had to stick to grenadine and beer so far. Well, I think you'll find this next one to your liking. Oh, what is it? Well... You've had the pastis and the kia. Mm. Now, this drink is the nearest you can get to absinthe these days. Oh. Mm. Yes, it's very, um, very um, warming. <laughs> I might go so far as to say that uh, absinthe makes the heart grow fonder. I might, but I don't think I will. How wise. Oh, this is very pleasant. It's so nice to be away from the child. Is she difficult? Not really. A bit irritating. It's just that I don't think I've got the patience to be a governess. Then why did you become one? Well, actually, I'm not really a governess. And this is strictly between the three of us. I'm a bit of a fraud. A what? I'm a fraud. You see, I've only been with Madame Mignard for four months. And before that, I'd never been a governess. What were you? I came to France three years ago with a cabaret troupe from England. Les Girls. You know the kind of show. I'm afraid I don't. I'm afraid I do. I used to sing and dance. Then when the engagement finished, I stayed on for a solo cabaret show. For two years, I did very well. Mm. Then I just couldn't get any work. And you'd be surprised how soon your savings go. So that's why I answered Madame's advertisement. And you really had never worked as a governess before? Well, how on earth did you get the job? Well, I had such excellent references. But how did you manage that? <laughs> I wrote them myself. <laughs> but that's forgery. Oh, Madame has never found out. And honestly, I've been quite a good governess. Loyal, efficient, hardworking and trustworthy. I think you've been reading your references too often. You'd have forged them too if you'd been in my position. Madame wouldn't have given me the job otherwise. She has a low opinion of people on the stage. So you're really a showgirl? Yes. Would you like to see my professional photographs? Oh, yes, I like looking at photos. So do I. Uh, here we are. Now, this one is me dressed as a Piero. Very nice. This one was taken during my opening number. Ah, and this is my costume for the finale. Good Lord. Well, it's no wonder they brought the curtain down after that. <laughs> Let's have a closer look. I sewed those sequins onto the brassiere myself. Oh. Oh. Uh, well done. How, how many are there? What about, what about these shorts? What about them? Well, they're a bit short. Well, that's the whole point. I don't think we'd better look at it anymore. Oh, it's all harmless fun. But you do realise that this isn't the only thing I do. Oh, dear. The more? I'm really an actress. I've had some small parts in West End shows before I came here. When I get back to England, I hope to pursue a career in the theatre. Well, we shall have to come and see you, won't we, Hume? Yes, I suppose we could. But in the meantime, I have to continue playing my part as a governess. What a bore. Thank goodness it's my day off tomorrow. What are you going to do? I'm planning to go to Malmaison to see the house where Josephine lived. That's funny, so am I. Really? I thought you'd be busy working, catching up on your caterpillars. Oh, too late. They've turned into butterflies. Oh. Why don't you go together? Oh, good idea. And won't you come too, Mr. Finchley? Oh, uh, um, well, uh, no, I don't think so. I, uh, I, I'm going to the Louvre tomorrow. You two go on your own. Are you sure? Yes, quite sure. Now, I think I'll be getting back. I, I've got an important letter to write. Oh, yes, I'll come too. Madame doesn't like me to be out too late. Well, that sounds funny. <laughs> I'm coming from a showgirl. And don't you dare mention it to Madame. No, don't worry, I won't. And just one more thing, Hume. Yes? Could I have my photograph back, please? <clears throat> Dear Mrs. Crantell, 
I am writing to you from Paris. I must apologize for not having informed you of my visit before I left London. This is an unexpected business trip which is taking longer than I had planned due to the irresponsible behavior of our client, Mr. Hamilton. I have, however, enjoyed my stay. I have done quite a lot of sightseeing and have even acquired a guide, a young English boy called Robert Gillespie. Tonight I spent the evening in the company of a delightful showgirl who, 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 who. Oh dear, no, 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 no. I'd better not mention her. Right. Um, tonight I spent the evening in the company of an entomologist. Yes. And a governess. And had the occasion to think of you. I trust that you are keeping well and that the weather is not inclement. Oh, come on, Finchley. You can do better than that. Sounds more like a postcard than a love letter. It is not a love letter. All right, then. It's a letter to the woman you love, the woman you're hoping to propose marriage to. You've just ended a sentence with a preposition. And you should be ending your sentence with a proposition. I rather think that's my business. Why don't you write about your feelings for her? Will you please not interfere? You're only the narrator. You're meant to tell people what's been said, not tell me what to say. All right. Have it your own way. I won't say another word. Well, for now, anyway. Thank you. Now, where was I? Um, let me see. Uh, so far, I've been to the Arc de Triomphe, the Eiffel Tower, the Madeleine... The next morning, Mr Finchley decided he would see the Louvre. He wandered along the Avenue Foch, lined with green lawns, and a wave of perfume from a flowering shrub swept into his nostrils. He could not help comparing the beauty of the place with the noise and heat of the Camden Road and the unlovely office of Sprake and Bardwell, where, on this Monday morning, his fellow clerks were working at their desks. As he stopped to watch a fat, pigeon waddle across the grass. A voice called his name, and a familiar figure raced towards him. Oh, there you are, monsieur. I was afraid I'd missed you. Robert, what are you doing here? Why aren't you at school? At school? Yes, you go to school, don't you? Of course, monsieur, but not today. Oh, why not? Um, because it's, um, it's a holiday. Yes, the feast of, um, St. Xavier. St. Xavier? Yes, that's right. And as you were kind enough to have me as a guide yesterday, I thought I'd come and see you again. But this time as a friend. You don't have to pay me. I've also told my friends, Michelle and Gaston, to meet us in the Latin Quarter. Oh, you have, have you? Listen, Robert, it may be all right to come rushing up to a Frenchman without warning to carry him away to some jaunt, but I, like all Englishmen, need a little time to think over what I will do. Oh, I see. Take all the time you need. Well? Well what? Well, have you had time to think about it? No, I haven't. Besides, who are Michelle and Gaston? You'll see. I've told them what a good friend of mine you are, and they're very anxious to meet you. I really don't have much of a choice, do I? Of course you have a choice. You can say yes and make me very happy, or you can say no and make me very unhappy. Not to mention Michelle and Gaston, who will be miserable and blame me. It will be a terrible St. Xavier's Day. Probably the worst ever. Well, is it yes or no? You have a way of putting things, Robert, that makes it very difficult to refuse. There they are. Michelle! Gaston! Hi, see That's Michelle and Gaston? Yes. But I thought they were school friends of yours. That one with the violin case is nearly as old as I am. <laughs> oh, no. He's not that old. Bonjour, monsieur. How do you do? Good morning. Here we all are together. This is going to be a very happy day. Good. Since Xavier will be pleased. You're both musicians. Ah, yes, we are musicians, monsieur. For us, music is live, and we go nowhere without our instruments. When we are separated from them, we are separated from life. Monsieur likes music? Oh, very much. Very much indeed. Frequently in London, I go to concerts and operas. Ah, the joy of music. Yeah. 
I am not angry when I can hear the great works of Mozart. I forget my thirst when I am with the noble Bach. Oh, I'll remember that next time I'm feeling a bit peckish. I'll pop into the Albert Hall instead of the Savoy Grill. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, uh, we have some business to attend to. Monsieur will have to excuse us. I suggest you wait in this cafe. We'll meet you back here in half an hour. Righto. Forty-five minutes later, Mr. Finchley had drunk three cups of coffee and had become tired of waiting. He walked up the boulevard, looking for Robert and his friends. Suddenly, ahead of him, he heard music, and a hundred yards in front, he saw Michel and Gaston playing their instruments. As he watched, Robert ran along the pavement from one person to another, holding out his cap. Seeing Finchley, Robert trotted up to him. I hope you're not expecting me to put any money in that cap. What's wrong, monsieur? I'm afraid I don't approve. Why not? It's only entertainment. Entertainment should be confined to a theatrical stage, not to the street. But it's fun. People must enjoy it because they give us money. But that's not the point. It's nothing more than begging. But don't people do this in England? Well, yes, but it's not the same. Why not? Oh, because it's you, Robert. It doesn't seem right for an English boy to be doing this, especially in a strange city. Walking in the gutter, asking strangers for money. What will become of you another two years of this kind of life, and who knows what could happen to you? I don't understand. I'm sorry if I've annoyed you. I am annoyed. You're not going back to them. But they need me. They'll just have to collect their own money. But, monsieur... Come along. Where are we going? We are going to the Louvre. Oh, no. We are going to the Louvre. I can't possibly come to Paris without seeing the Mona Lisa. Ah, the Mona Lisa? Well... You may not believe this, but there's a woman just like her who sells crayfish in the Place de la République. She's much more beautiful. Perhaps you'd like to meet her instead. No, Robert, I wouldn't. And there's a fair we could go to. How about doing a deal? If I go to the Louvre with you, will you take me to the fair tonight? Robert, I don't make deals with ten-year-old boys. In any case, I can't. Mr. Hume and I are going to the casino tonight to see Maurice Chevalier. I'll tell you what. Tomorrow night is my last night in Paris, and so I'll take you out for dinner. Oh, thank you, monsieur. Now I'm happy. That's better. How nice to see you smile. Now, let's go off and see if we can raise a smile on the face of the Mona Lisa, eh? <laughs> At nine o'clock on Tuesday morning, Mr. Finchley rang up the Marivaux Hotel and discovered that Mr. Hamilton had been delayed yet again. They would not be able to meet until four o'clock that afternoon. To fill the time, Mr Finchley visited the Sacré-Cœur and a newsreel cinema. At two minutes to four, Finchley entered a plush hotel suite and finally came face to face with Hamilton. Ah, sorry to have kept you hanging about. Still, I expect you found something to do in Paris. If I know lawyers, you'll charge me with the expenses, hmm? The wait has certainly not been unpleasant, sir. Here are various documents relating to the inheritance, all of which I presume you'll want to have a little time to look through. Some of them need your signature, duly witnessed, of course. If there are any points on which you'd like advice, I should be glad yes, to... Yes, 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 of course. I'll take a look at them later. The old boy died just in time, didn't he? I've been fortunate in my relatives. They never seem to have kept me waiting when I was in need. <laughs> so it seems. There is one further point, sir. What's that? Most of your uncle's securities and investments were English, and Sprake and Bardwell, of course, acted for him during his lifetime, so unless you've already decided otherwise, we should be very happy to perform the same duty for you. Oh, why not? I don't care who looks after it, as long as I have the spending of it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We very much appreciate the honour. I do assure you. No, 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 don't assure me of anything. And stop talking like something that's been wound up. Here, sit down there and be human for a moment. Blow your nose, scratch your head, do something, anything, to show that you're not clockwork. Um, well, I could light my pipe. Will that be all right? Yes, good idea. Go on, then. Light it. <laughs> That's better. You haven't a very high opinion of me, have you, Mr Finchley? Mr. Hamilton, I assure you that my... No, there you go, assuring me again. Please don't be polite with me. I'm not asking you to be polite, but to be truthful. I shouldn't think much of you if you didn't think I was as much used to the world as a piece of dried putty. 
Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that. Do you know what I've done with my life? I'll tell you. In the last 30 years, I've wandered from one country to another and managed to spend three fortunes doing it. I've spent carelessly the money which other people have worked hard to make. And what have I to show for it? Well, I imagine... The money brought me nothing worth remembering except a string of hotel names. No adventures more exciting than missing a boat or having my pocket picked. I used to think the money would attract adventure and excitement, but it didn't. And here I am at 50 with this new fortune dropped into my lap to save me from a string of debts and to set the ball rolling again. Let's face it, I'm a selfish, arrogant, inconsiderate, egotistical, worthless creature. Well, nobody's perfect. In any case, you could change. You're not too old to make a fresh start. That's what I keep telling myself. But you don't know how much easier it is to say than to do. Change my life. <laughs> what could I do? Are you seriously asking me to suggest things you might do? Yes, I am. Hmm. Suppose you were in my position and suddenly realised you wanted to get a new grip on life. What would I do? Well, let me see. Um, well, I'd grow roots, that's what I'd do. Hmm? I'd go back to England, buy a farm and make a place for myself in my own country. I'd forget hotels and have my own four walls and I'd take pride in owning pigs and sheep, not motor cars and yachts. As long as I had a field of corn to look at, I'd forget the best views in the world. And what's more, I might even get married. Yeah. Well, I don't think I'm prepared to go that far. But you have helped me. You told me to do the very thing I've been thinking about for weeks. Oh, I? Oh, good. Look, we've got to talk more about this farm idea. You must have dinner with me tonight. I'll have those papers ready for you by then, and we can discuss it further. It's very important to me. Well, that would be very nice, but I'm afraid there's one small problem. Robert Gillespie. Who's he? A boy who seems to have adopted me, and I promised to take him out for dinner. I couldn't possibly disappoint him. Well, in that case, bring the boy as well. He'll get a thrill out of dining at the Marivaux. Apart from Randolph Brewster the Third, there aren't many youngsters who have the chance to eat in these splendid surroundings. Apart from whom? Randolph Brewster the Third, the boy millionaire who's staying here. He's an American, you know. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think I saw him in the newsreel this afternoon. Well, perhaps your Robert might even pal up with him, eh? Hmm, no, I don't think I'll tell him. If he knows the boy's a millionaire, he might produce that begging cap of his. After a sumptuous dinner, and with the three of them in high spirits, Robert persuaded Finchley and Hamilton to go to the fair. The whole of the Place de la République was taken over and the air was full of clashing music and the cries of men and women. This is remarkable. I've never seen so many stalls and sideshows. <laughs> I haven't been to a fair for years. Come on, let's get some gingerbread. They had their names written in sugar across the back of a gingerbread pig. And then, each with a pig in hand, they visited the Snake Charmer, the Wild West Show and the Scenic Railway. I'm sorry, but I don't care what you say. You're not getting me up in that. But everybody goes on the scenic railway. No, not everybody. Hamilton, you'll go, Robert, won't you? Oh, thanks very much, Finchley. Look, I told you everybody goes on it. Over there, it's Mr Hume with the lady. Ah, Mary Peters. It must be frightening, because she's holding him very tight. Yes, she is, isn't she? Shall we call out to them? No, 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 don't do that. I don't think they'll want our company. Come on, Monsieur Hamilton. Let's get on it. Uh -huh. You carry on. I'll be at that stall over there, trying to win a prize. I wonder if Mrs. Crantel likes girls. The question remained hypothetical because he didn't win a prize. But later, at the shooting gallery, Mr. Finchley showed himself to be a marksman par excellence. There you are. What do you think of that? Every plate smashed to smithereens. Even the stall holder seems excited. Yes, that's probably because you've just destroyed all his prizes. Leaving the scene of the crime, they found themselves standing before a booth whose banner proclaimed the glamour and mystery of the South Sea Follies. On the platform, outside the booth, a group of girls in reed skirts pirouetted to the sound of the music. The girls, tired and unattractive, leered provocatively at the crowd. I think we'll give this one a miss. But, monsieur, there's a magician. Look, he's pulled a chicken from his mouth. Oh, uh, anybody can do that. Well, come on, we'll find another magician for you. Mr Finchley led Robert away, but he was not to be dissuaded so easily. Taking advantage of a sudden swell in the crowd, Robert broke away and returned to the South Sea Follies. 
He stood eyeing the painted canvas and wishing he had the price of admission. A man who seemed to have been following Robert for some time came up to his side and nodded towards the show. It's really very good. How did you know I speak English? Well, lucky guess. Would you care to see the show? Very much. But I haven't got any money. Oh, you don't have any money, huh? Come on, I'll take you in. Robert! Oh, there you are. What are you doing? This gentleman has kindly offered to take me into the show. Oh, has he? That's all right, isn't it? No, no, it isn't all right. Monsieur, I was only... Be quiet. What on earth do you think you're doing? Trying to kidnap the boy? Uh, Leave before I punch you on the nose and call the police to you for creating a public disturbance. I meant no harm. But you will come to some if you don't go away right now. Good work, Hamilton. Come on, Robert. I think we ought to get you home before you get into any further scrapes. Come along. The three of them took a taxi to the Boulevard de la Bastille and alighted halfway down. On the other side, running the whole length of the road, was a coal and merchandise wharf. At the dockside were three long barges with tarpaulins over their decks and small cabins at their sterns. That's the one, the Swan of Paris. Good gracious. A barge. And that's where you live with Pepe? Yes. Isn't she a beauty? Very nice. And um, with a cut of paint, she'd be even better. There's no point. You paint a white, you load the coal, and the white turns to black. I suppose you're right. <sighs> now I am tired. I think I'm going to go to bed. Well, good night, Robert. Good night. Will I see you tomorrow, Monsieur Finchley? Um, I, I'm not going home until the afternoon. I'll tell you what, if you come up to the apartment in the morning, you can help me pack. Oh, thanks. See you tomorrow. Good night, Robert. Well, I never. He told me he lived by the river, not on it. He obviously doesn't think it's at all unusual. Well, there it is. He's happy enough, I suppose. Yes, he is. Huh? Good evening, monsieur. I am Pepe. And you are Monsieur Finchley? Yes. Uh, Robert told me that you were here and I wanted to meet you. I understand you're Robert's guardian. He lives with me since his father is dead. Hmm. Monsieur does not know about his father? No, nothing at all. You see, his father was my friend. Hmm. He was an artist. Robert's mother left soon after he was born and we heard later that she had drowned. How oh. awful. Then his father died when Robert was a small boy, so... Oh. I looked after him. He has no friends or relations in England. You're quite sure that he has no one? Oh, absolutely, monsieur. But I always make him talk English, for someday he may want to go back to his country. Yes, very sensible. I try to teach Robert what I can. He is a clever boy, but there are many things he misses. Now, monsieur, I am very rude to keep you standing here. Would you not come to my cabin and drink with me? Now, it's very kind of you, but it's rather late. Yes, uh, thank you, Pepe, but uh, I think we'll be getting along. Uh, good night. And then, goodbye, monsieur. Good night. Oh, dear, what a tragic story. Well, then remember that the boy is happy. Think of the life he must lead aboard that barge. What boy wouldn't enjoy that? I suppose so, but most children can manage to be happy wherever they are. But that isn't enough. Robert has his whole life in front of him. He's such a bright young boy. What will become of him? Well, there's no point in worrying about him, Finchley. We can't do anything about it. No. I don't suppose we can. When Mr Finchley awoke the next morning, he realised that the legal documents were still in Hamilton's possession. Finchley duly arranged to collect them after breakfast. Robert arrived at his lodgings as planned and then travelled with Finchley to the Marivaux. After the papers had been signed, they left the hotel and got into a waiting taxi. Um, rule shower grounds to the play. In you get, Robert. I wish you weren't going. Paris will seem so different without you. And London won't be the same without you. Can you make some excuse for staying another day? Peppy says there is always a good excuse to be found for doing a thing you want to do. No, Robert. I'd like to stay, but I have to get back to my office in London. Cheer up. I promise to write to you. Oh, why are we stopping here? I say, what are you hooting for? 
Move over, please. Hey, this is our taxi. You can't get in here. What on earth do you think you're doing? I, I've hired this cab to take me to my lodging. <laughs> you may have hired this cab, but it belongs to me. Driver. Monsieur. Please stop by the next gendarme and ask him to remove this person from the taxi. Oh. <laughs> Jacques is always polite, but he will not obey you. You do not recognize him today? That is because he is wearing his false moustache. Wait a minute. It's the man from the fair. Well, look, will you please explain what all this means? Uh, certainly, but in good time. For a few days now, we have been waiting for this moment. Now we are enjoying our triumph. You must wait for an explanation. He's a bandit. He wants our money. I do not care to be called a bandit by such as you. You had better be quiet. Look, you just wait a minute. I'm not going to sit here and oh, take... Oh, but you will. It is best that you both sit very still and not make a nuisance of yourselves. Otherwise, I will have to use this. <gasps> Believe me, I would not feel guilty if I were to kill you. In fact, it would be a pleasure. Oh, Lord. In episode three of Mr. Finchley Goes to Paris by Victor Canning, Richard Griffiths played the part of Mr. Finchley, Nicky Henson was Hamilton, Geoffrey Holland was Michel, James Cohen was Robert Gillespie, Serena Evans was Marie Peters, Piers Gibbon was Lawrence Hume, David Howarth was Gaston, and Simon Roberts was Jerome Giraud. The narrator was James Villers. Mr. Finchley Goes to Paris was adapted for radio by Andy and Eric Merriman, and the producer was Gareth Edwards. <laughs>